Thank you for joining us tonight to see artists talking about open music. My name is Melissa Diaz. I'm the cultural arts curator for the Bueno School. Um, we've invited Frozen Music as a collective to come and participate in the current exhibition, The Spring Contemporary Homemaking. The Spring Contemporary is our major contemporary art exhibition that happens in the spring every year. Each iteration deals with a different theme or topic. And the current exhibition, Homemaking, is an exhibition that explores the notions of city, identity, site, and community. It explores this concept as a precursor to the centennial celebration of the Stone House, which will be happening in 2022. Homemaking brings together a group of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary artists um, that take a variety of, approach of approaches in considering what makes a house a home. The exhibition includes painting, sculpture, photography, performance, and sound installation, each considering the site as both a domestic space filled with memories as well as identities and histories. Frozen Music is a collective of sound artists, Gustavo Madonna, David Dunn, and Lee Barge, who are with us tonight. For their project, Paranorma, mm -hmm. um, FM captured the often unnoticed or overlooked sounds of the Deering Estate through an overnight, or several overnight, rather, surveys of the Richmond Cottage. Paranormal activates listeners' senses, activating a deeper immersion into the spiritual energy of the Richmond Cottage. And composed of uniquely calibrated and fine-tuned audio recordings, capturing vibrations of wood and, acoust and the acoustical profile of the architecture of the cottage. I'll have them discuss a little bit further about their topics, but I'd like to introduce you tonight to Gustavo Matamores, David Dunn, and Renee Barge. So just Hello. To, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> to kick things off, um, could each of you kind of discuss a little bit about how Frozen Music came to be from your perspectives and how the collective came about? May, well, maybe I can talk about the name of the uh, of the collective. Right. We um, because the idea for frozen music was to like publicly engage in the acoustical exploration of uh, you know architectural and natural environments. I you know kind of ran into a I ran into a quote by the architect Anthony Gaudí, who said that architecture is frozen music. But then, you know, after that, I sort of learned about, you know, the philosopher Pythagoras, who also said that a stone is frozen music. So, so there we have, you know, nature, in the shape of a stone and architecture representing the man-made kind of interpretation uh, of nature maybe. Uh, and then between the two is frozen music. And so that, you know, <laughs> that was a, uh, a way to come up with that name. So I just always assumed that if uh, architecture is frozen music, and that means music is the architecture. Yes, that's right. So that's been so uh, one of our agendas is to sort exactly. of make music that's right. architecture itself. Yeah, in interaction with architecture, that's right, and the environment. Um, it, yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, at some point I thought, well, maybe a better name it would be uh, fluid architecture, right? The opposite of frozen music. Uh, but it, you know that doesn't include the stone, uh, although the stone is part of architecture. Uh, who knows? If we can go down the rabbit hole that way, <laughs> and we did. We did. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, that was the easiest problem to solve, I think, or maybe the hardest in frozen music, because the rest has worked out 
actually quite naturally, I think. Can you talk a little bit about how you met, how you all came to work together? Oh, Gustavo, start that too. Okay, well, uh, yeah, um, let's see. First, I met David, right? Uh, after I met Rene. Um, Rene is, uh, you know, has been living in Miami. So we, we met simply, uh, he, he was interested in what we were doing up in North Miami at a studio uh, and became quite, you know, good friends very, very fast. Uh, because we had similar interests in, in sound. And then I met David uh, from uh, being on a panel that reviewed one of his applications and awarded him the prize. And uh, of course, uh, I, I knew about his work before, um, but I hadn't really, you know, delved into it. And of course, this became an opportunity for us to meet. We met really in New York. And then we started kind of, uh, you know, we, I run, um, the organization that I run is called the Subtropics Organization, South Florida Composers Alliance. Uh, and we do a festival called Subtropics. And, you know, so that very year, David became one of the guests. And so we started uh, an interaction. And then in 2009, uh, we had our 20th anniversary of the festival. And uh, one of the questions, I mean, the idea was to bring our advisory board, which is a number of artists from out of town uh, that include, you know, Robert Ashley and Alvin Lucier and all uh, and some of these people. And a few of them were able to come to town, including David. And at that meeting, you know, we discuss uh, the notion that the festival, you know, it was attracting, a, you know, a, a number of uh, audiences, not necessarily too different from what happens in New York or Chicago or anything like that, but, but there was a number, you know, a small number, you know, it's an experimental music audience. Um, and the Somewhere, so, sometime along the meeting, someone said, uh, maybe Steve Peters, I recall, maybe someone else uh, mentioned, well, you know, if people aren't coming to where the music is happening, maybe you should come up with ideas to bring the music to where people already gather. And so Frozen Music was that first idea, to start a, an ensemble that would perform uh, taking advantage of, of situations that were already organized in terms of, you know, having an audience, et cetera, et cetera. Our, our first uh, event then was a, a Sleepless Night, which, was, which had 120,000 people came to Miami Beach for a 13 hour long event that started at six in the afternoon and ended at six o'clock in the morning. Um, on the longest day of the year. And we performed for 13 hours, a piece called Canal. And it was experienced by 50,000 people. And that audience was larger than all the festival we had done <laughs> before it. And in one evening we, uh, we, you know, did the first frozen music event and it was very well received. It was really well received. So, and it was a tremendous experience for all of us. So, so we kept doing. That's fantastic. Um, for each individual artist in your own right, can you? Can I'd you... like to add to that oh, yeah. if I could. Um, yes, I think you can. something it's, I, I, I want to point out because I think it's important uh, in the context of the question. Um, that I had uh, for, for some time been contemplating going to, um, to study with uh, a media pioneer who I studied with here in Miami. I, I got really lucky to land as a student at FIU during the time that uh, FIU had a professor named Christine Tamlin. This is going back to the 90s. She's uh, a, an incredibly uh, 
a forward thinking artist and and like I said she was a media pioneer um, she went to Cal Arts and the plan was at some point for me to go to Cal Arts I was busy with the band Cavity very busy with the band Cavity at that time uh, and and in it and in our own right pioneering uh, a form of very heavy 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 rock uh, and um, during that time, while she was in Cal Arts, she developed cancer and passed away. Uh, so when when cavity loosened up a bit and we just weren't so busy and focused anymore, I had to to deal with the question. Like I wanted to go do a master's program. I had wanted to go and study with somebody that was a mentor, but I I lost my mentor, right? And so the question was, you know, what do I do now? Do, you know, do I do I want to go to a, another arts program? Or can this be, you know, done differently? And what happened as a result was uh, I was able to develop a relationship with Gustavo, who had a relationship with, really, what constitutes the, the history of, of of modern art, uh, sound art, music, experimental music, and composition. Uh, and I thought, you know, who who needs to go to a, a traditional program? Uh, which, which, you know, at that time, you know, Noam Chomsky was uh, kind of saying like, look, you know, you're, you're going to art school is the equivalent to going to journalism school, right? You're going to go to journalism school to be a radical, uh, but that radicalism is, a, is an indoctrination, right? Uh, you're not going to come out a radical. You're not going to come out, you know, by radical, I mean something different other than what you are or what you perceive things to be, I mean, that's why we would go get an education, right? At least I hoped at that time. Uh, but and I found that in uh, Subtropics, right? He, he was a man in Miami who had a rich history connected to many people who had a rich history, and f in my and struck striking up a relationship with Gustavo was not difficult at all. We had a lot of similar interests, and I was able to find a mentor in Gustavo, and later on. David Dunn, uh, you know, as we came together, and and that's important to point out because it allowed me to to be the person that I felt comfortable being, which is a person who listens. I I listen a lot, and I can listen, you know, to Gustavo, and I can listen to David, uh, and that that knowledge that they impart, you know, in combination with my own experimentation, is I think the 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 best thing that could have happened to me rather than a traditional master's degree. Uh, and my resumes, I, 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 I've penned that as eloquently as possible because it's not many people that get to have an opportunity, you know, to work under uh, people that are as experienced uh, as Gustavo and David and, and yet be, and yet still have the opportunity to be, be my own person too. So I wanted to point that out. That's great, and that and that brings me to really to my next question too, is to, to unpack a little bit. You're each individual artist in your own right, and you were before coming together to create the ensemble. Can you share a little bit about your individual practices, and then how that practice became FM? How you guys brought those elements together to create FM? We start with David this time. <laughs> well, we're all really very different artists but we also have really common interests and, and there's similarities in the work we do is very distinct there's also real common concerns and real, um, uh, it's, it was really easy in the sense that we just really kind of do what we do anyway and we just do it together so it's not it's not so much most of the performances that we've done have not been so much a um, a contrivance to try to meld things together. We simply have this shared common interest in sound and the ex using sound as an exploratory tool, whether it's towards the environment or to whatever circumstance we're sort of playing in given whatever the performance or the event that we're doing. So it, it's been really quite a simple thing to do. Um, we just kind of prepare our own material and then we show up and we do it simultaneously. And we do that though in the, in the presence of each other. So we're intensely listening to each other, but we're also 
the choice of material, the choice of um, structure, or the way we do that, nothing is really all that much planned in advance. It's simply allowing us each to do our thing in a common space. And it always just simply works because while it's very distinct and the choice of materials are very different, there's also enough crossover that everything kind of speaks to each other in a, in a really direct way. Yeah, uh, that's speaking to the to the to the, the the performance itself. But um, I don't know if if you. But we we just speak a little bit about your own your own work. Uh, well, I mean, I'm the old guy here, so uh, so there's a long it's a long history of of work going back um, uh, uh, quite a while ago. I was fortunate speak to what Rene was talking about. I also had the real good fortune when I was young to work with some incredible mentors. And they were people that I just, I never, I ended up having some, I have degrees and a lot of you know, experience as an academic, but um, most of my early life, I didn't even want to go to university or do anything like that. And my choice for an education was very much what Renee is speaking to, which was to choose people I simply wanted to work with, people who really interested me. One of those who I happened to hear a, a, a television broadcast when, when I was growing up in San Diego, California, was a documentary that was broadcast on the composer Harry Parch. And Parch is a fairly, at this point, a, a kind of cult figure, one of the really important figures in the history of experimental music in, in the United States and North America at large. He um, invented all his own musical instruments and was an extraordinary theorist that rethought through a lot of the materials of music based upon ancient Greek, ancient Chinese, um, lots of materials that were, that were, he was one of the first composers to embrace the idea of world music and his materials and his, and his work reflected that. And so when I was 17, I just simply sought him out. And I did that by going to a local university and enrolling in a class of the person that I knew was his main assistant. And then I ended up being I, the first day of class, I went up to the, after the class and went up to the professor and I said, I'm really not interested in your class, but I'm really interested in Harry Parch. And he took that really well and took me to <laughs> Harry. And then I moved into Harry's house that summer and began building instruments with him and had a, 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 a close friendship and worked as his assistant for the next four years. And then I continued to play his music for another uh, probably 10 years. And then there were a couple other people who were like that too. And, and so my education really was seeking out these mentors. Another one was Paulino Oliveros, who had this very visionary um, insight into sound and meditation and sound as a means by which we expand consciousness. And then another composer, Kenneth Gaburo, who was uh, really interested in the relationship of music to, to human language. And all those things shaped my early life. And eventually I um, sort of began composing pretty early on and then, and then continued to explore different things based upon a lot of these influences. And pretty early on got interested in the idea of when I was in my 20s, God, this is so long ago, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, the idea of site specific sound as, in, as a means of activating location and exploring. I was very influenced and very impressed by land art and the earthworks uh, movement that was occurring in the 1970s and wanted to do something equivalent to that only using sound. And the reason for doing that was I was interested in having some kind of exploring something about that relationship to the physical environment through sound, but sound had the advantage of not being permanent. It was it was something that could come and go and not leave scars upon the, the landscape. And so I did a lot of work in the 1970s, 1980s, dealing with site-specific performance that also the whole, so whole time that I was doing that, I was also very interested in field recording and what we now call sand, soundscape recording, documenting and sound locations and, and specialized sounds. And then 
That led to an interest in building new transducer systems that could amplify phenomena in the environment. Um, I was interested in interspecies communication, so I was doing things where I was stimulating insects and birds using a portable computer systems built really early on sampling systems before they were commercially available. And had to do that by things like building, uh, uh, using like a little missile guidance computers and programming them to do sampling so I could interact with in real time in the environment. And all that led on and on, of course, also doing more traditional kinds of things musically. And so a lot of that are materials that now play into my contribution and participation in, in frozen music. Um, a lot of the things that we do where we amplify sounds, um, we use those kinds of transducers and those kinds of, of sound um, capturing devices and materials. That's probably enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, I didn't mean. Uh, well, you know, actually picking up on that, they, they, you know, uh, when I met you, one of the things that uh, I have been doing, uh, uh, you know, everything that I think about uh, when I'm asked to describe what I, I do is sort of like in retrospect, because when I'm doing things, I'm never really conscious of what I'm doing in terms of how, what it means in the art world or what, any, anything like that. Uh, I'm simply trying to uh, use sound as a tool for understanding something. And that something can be the environment, can be architecture, can be whatever, um, you know, so in similar ways that people use their eyes and make drawings and things like that as an attempt to kind of understand something better. Um, that's a, a, so clear, of course in interaction, that's why I also had the idea to, to start this festival, uh, the Sotropolis Festival as a vehicle for establishing direct relationships similar to Rene and David with artists whom I knew I had something to learn from that was somehow uh, different from what I, you know, discovered while going through school was available to me in academia. I mean, I was reading about these people in books and things while I was in school, but but somehow those thoughts and those ideas were not being explored deeply, at least not at the level I was in school for. So I was not, you know, disappointed about having been to school, but but I quickly understood I had to kind of uh, go back to the way I was trying to kind of explore my own interest in sound and uh, a. Early after school, I met uh, a local artist also by the name of Russell Freling, the first sound artist in Miami. And he taught me a few things. So I would consider him, him one of my mentors. Um, and with him, you know, he, he through him, I, I, I got possession of a, of a, of a, of a, you know, this is like early 80s. Uh, so he gave me a couple of uh, phono cartridges that came from David Tudor. And uh, and I also, you know, picked up while in school, you know, the, in our electronic music studio, there were a few, you know, piezoelectric, you know, discs and things like that. So I, I learned about those things. I started building some of those. And, and very quickly started exploring what I call, what I've been calling small sounds and just simply, you know, small objects and their acoustical properties of small objects and this. Uh, so for a long time, I've been doing that and uh, creating pieces inspired by those things. I did many other things, but, but when I met David in 2005 and he taught me about his, designs of these microphones that were specifically designed for, for specific uses, you know, like extracting the sound of bark beetles inside a tree and, and you know, 
uh, sounds of ants in their nests and things like that, that I all of a sudden, you know, uh, there was another world that opened up as well. So, you know, I mean, we discovered that we had all these things in common. Uh, some of the people that we were, I mean, as we talked, we were interested in the same people, you know, these names, you know, David Tudor and John Cage and, and all these people are people who, you know, in our world, they're very big. They may not be necessarily that well known. Uh, I think they're very well known in the art world now because sound has become a thing. And uh, although I sort of like try to stay away from the, you know, the fat qualities of art and, you know, keep focus on, on the exploration, uh, these things are becoming, you know, uh, popular now. And um, this is, I guess, I guess this is good. Uh, I hope it is good for the art because sometimes I feel that sometimes art suffers from some of these tendencies um but anyway uh so so all of these kind of let let leads to the notion that um that part of the core of frozen music i think is like there's an underlying principle right where the function of it is, it is enacted through listening right it's a, it's like we we come in with certain materials that we have actually been working with for a long time, materials that we know very intimately, and that somehow we have organized in ways that that make sense to us. Like one of the quotes that I remember a lot when I when I'm working like this is John Cage's famous quote about what is the function of art and the function of art being the to imitate nature in its manner of operation. And I think that's one of the things that, that as individuals and as a group, frozen music does very well, which is, which is we, we sort of, uh, you know, create things that behave like, <laughs> like things in nature. I mean, the sounds that we manufacture in the studio, for instance, or that we uh, program, you know, like in the case of David, you know, programs to, to generate electronic sounds that are autonomous, you know, in the way they behave. These behaviors are actually, you know, very much like the behaviors that you encounter when you go to the Everglades or you go anywhere, right? So I think that's uh, so the, another key word for frozen music is tuning. So this, uh, this notion of tuning, and this is, it, so, so, instead of being like a jazz trio, right? Where we kind of like are, you know, kind of having a conversation between Rene, David and I through our particular sound material, what we're really doing is having a conversation with the environment, each of us. And that conversation then results in this very intricate, you know, fabric of activity that resembles you know, something, by the way, we have no idea what's gonna happen. We come in with this material, it's new material, each time we try to bring something new. And so, you know, it's a new piece every time we do one. And, uh, but what makes it new too is, is our own uh, discovery of the space in which this is happening and how these sounds can be used to kind of bring out things about that environment that are unique and, and identifiable of that environment. And that's exciting because every time we do these things we each of us discovers something. And I think that this discovery, you know, the audience is in on it. So, so yeah, that's, that's my, that's my contribution. With that in mind, I, I think um, maybe you could unpack a little bit um, your approach to the site. You know, when you when you take on a new project, let's say um, your practices is both intuitive. There's a, a level of, of intuitiveness, and then there's a lot of research as well that the three of you provide. 
could you maybe approach, we could even use the Deering project as an example, like the Richmond Cottage, approach that as um, like how you approach the site, where do you start? What, what are the first things that you kind of think about? Well, I think that I came up with the idea and uh, I, there's two things, that, uh, the idea to propose that project. There's two things that I was thinking about. Uh, you know, uh, recently uh, we had, uh, you know, unfortunately a very dear friend, similar to David and Renee, you know, just passed away. His name is uh, Sam Ashley. Uh, Sam Ashley is the son or the last of the Ashleys. Uh, Robert Ashley was a very famous uh, opera composer. Uh, but Sam, Sam's work was very much related to the idea of of trance and and you know connecting with something outside of our our perception. Okay, um, and he he made very interesting work. And and I, I uh, about two years ago he came down with some kind of uh, syndrome that almost paralyzed him and for two years you know he was kind of like in health so so he just passed away uh that was to be expected but i mean he would have been a very good collaborator <laughs> you know this time because i think that part of the paranormal idea was in a way to you know uh, you know how people who organize art events talk about you know audience development right so outreach and for me, a natural approach, these things. So at least that's what I think. But um, so, you know, we're often surprised how many people like us are there around the world. We, sometimes we're not aware of everybody, but um, anyway, so, so based on that and knowing that there was, you know, this notion it, of, of paranormal activity in the in the house that you know that was an interesting idea and also kind of you know kind of i took i took interest in exploring that even kind of as a as a piggybacking on this notion of uh, but then our work as you know as frozen music is in fact to monitor the environment to find things that are not necessarily easy easily available to our naked senses. So, so in that perspective, you know, and speaking with each other, David immediately said, well, you know, we can make full spectrum recordings. And David, among the microphone designs uh, that he's come up with are these ultrasonic microphones which I think he developed to record bats, but they're perfectly good for recording anything else that happens outside our frequency range of hearing, you know, our normal range. So, so we made these recordings, long, long recordings, overnight recordings uh, inside the house of pretty much nothing except for the house. So, uh, and the purpose of those recordings was to basically, uh, after having them, then try to find within those recordings, you know, uh, events and things that, uh, especially at the ultrasonic range, which is, and, um, and also because I'm interested in small sounds, you know, try to find things that are normally too faint for us to be able to hear and then try to find a way to, to mic the house in a way that maybe will reveal some of these things. I think it'd be useful to just sort of add to that, that uh, one of the things that, that is an important focus in the whole field of so-called sound art is very much this idea of accessing or, or getting um, uh, uh, how do we amplify, how do we make audible and to our senses things which are largely outside the domain of our senses? You know, everything, 
we, we, we're awash in electromagnetic phenomena that constitutes reality. And our senses are just very, very um, fairly limited devices that can only, only allow us to perceive a, a limited aspect of the entire spectrum of what the reality that, we're, that we reside in. So one of the, the issues that, that what we're doing and a lot of other people are doing is the idea of sound as an exploratory tool. But in order to do that, one has to have a technology or instrumentation that will provide access to those things which our, our ears are not meant to perceive. And one of the ideas about sound is also that sound isn't just what our ears pick up. Our bodies are, are, are sensate, uh, we're, we're organisms that pick up the, the totality of this in different kinds of ways. And we're not only aware, always aware of what it actually we're perceiving. One of the things that when I started to build these kind of ultrasonic transducer systems, these microphones, one of the first things I did was the time that my, my father was ill and he was in the hospital time right before he passed away. And I was curious about what it was that he was actually perceiving because it seemed to me that there was so much machinery and life support and all the things that were going on in the hospital room. So I recorded the room that he was in with one of these microphone systems. And it was absolutely amazing to perceive, to see what it was that actually all the vibratory phenomena that actually is occurring in an environment like that. And it's not just in the hospital room, it's everywhere we go. We're constantly being bombarded by things that we think we're not actually perceiving. We now know that that human uh, oral perception extends way, way up into the ultrasonic range. It's just that our ears, the, the ossicles of the middle ear are not particularly good at transducing those materials to the oral, to, the, to, the, to how the, the brain actually will pick that up. But we do pick it up through facial tissue, fluid channels within the upper body. And it's something that um, actually our brains spend a good bit of time trying to make sense of, even though we're not necessarily conscious of it. So this project was kind of a natural extension of how, how the sound art world explores this and tries to, to provide access to the experience of things. Our ears aren't good at underwater, and yet we know that water is a much better transducing medium for the physicality of sound than air is. Um, things sound hidden inside, whether it's trees or inside the ground, the vibrate. We live in a vibratory plenum and it's constantly occurring all around us. And the question is, how do we provide access to a deeper experience of the, of what the reality is that we're actually living in? So this project was a pretty good extension of that. It was a pretty natural extension of that. How do we use these tools? What's going in, going on inside of a of a house that's 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 quite old and full of of history and the activity of of people living and moving and experiencing that? Are there traces of these things? And so much of these things we we sort of have referred to as paranormal normal phenomena. And I would think that actually we just simply don't understand the phenomena. We don't understand what is actually there. And of course, it's sort of can be at times the basis for kind of silly TV shows where people are going out and you know do, using these technologies to do these things. But on another level, there's like something significant to that. It's like wow, you know, we we uh, we take for granted or we assume that we know what's going on, and uh, there, there's a lot of evidence that somehow what we're experiencing is only the tip of the iceberg. Isn't that what we call paranormal, like the things we don't understand that we can so. perceive? Yeah, I think so. Just simply yeah. out of the domain of, of our yes. daily experience. And yet, and yet um, you know, we, we've all had experiences, I think, that we can't explain. There are things that, go <laughs> whether there are the things that go bump in the night or whether it's, you know, uh, the evidence of other animals sensing exactly. around us. There's something, it would be ridiculous. It is ridiculous to think that somehow um, uh, that there's, that, that it's limited to what we simply, I mean, when I think it's interesting, like my recent, we have a new born, now she's a year old, granddaughter who 
when she was first born, we would observe her. It was amazing, her eye movements of something going on in the space. And at first, it seemed like you could sort of say, oh, well, you know, the spirits are moving. But I don't think it's that simple. I think it's that the brain is forming. And this environment that's around us that we, we have evidence of, like with, you know, someone like my friend Terrence McKenna, who was, you know, the, the great guru of psychedelics, um, would argue that that these are things we rewire, we rewire the brain in various means, and whether it's through psychedelics or whether it's through sound or whether it's through some other sensory play that we participate in, the brain is a malleable thing. And in the course of shaping itself, the reality that we experience is something that's largely formed by conditioning. And it's conditioning, we are born into a culture and that culture seeks to have us be a participant within it. And that's an incredible thing. But at the same time, it's like, it's, it's also a limiting factor. So much of culture is a thing that shapes us to, to narrow our perception, to be able to participate in the meaning and reality of, of that culture. And there's a lot more going on outside of that. And we have evidence that just from the simply fact of the divergence and diversity of, of cultures across the planet, or the divergence, the diversity of, of sensing and, and the way in which other life forms actually make sense of their world and communicate it to each other. So it's an opportunity. It was here, it was an opportunity. How do we, uh, how do we explore something and use these same tools to, to to listen in on something that is our ordinary experience. And it's working because we're having a really good year. <laughs> 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 We've done so many uh, events this year because we do them outdoors and in interaction with, uh, and then, you know, people can bring their mask and socially distance. We've been doing what we call sound picnics at parks uh, since January. So it's been really incredible. So we've been lucky, you know, to be doing something that somehow happened to be okay. Because, <laughs> you know, doing a, a online events for us didn't make any sense at all. Because, you know, the, the work is about interaction with with stuff and the environment and things. And, and so an interface such as this doesn't really quite, and I don't have any ideas really for, for some music in this context. Do you, David? Or Rene? I'm, I'm, Sorry, I'm, no? I'm not sure what the question, what, what you said. Well, the, the question meaning that, uh, uh, you know, the Zoom, you know, this, this uh, virtual, a oh. world doesn't really kind of match the the nature of our project so it, it 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 would have been very difficult for us to come up with ideas for how to you know engage in a pro in an online project i think it's pretty pretty clear the experience of, of everyone i think during the time of the pandemic has been yeah we have the availability of these technologies and they're extraordinarily useful but at the same time, it's like all of education has largely been now forced into this conduit of something where we're looking at little screens like we are right now. And, and while that's that's extraordinary thing that also provides uh, the possibilities that of, of communication, it also, again, it's like a narrowing. It's like not, we're not experiencing a whole lot of, of of information that ordinarily will occur through through human communication, and so a lot is left out. And in the case of what frozen music does, it's like it's mostly what we're about is all the stuff that's being left out by this mode of communication. I think Renee was going to jump in there. <laughs> no, I was just saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But my mic was muted. <laughs> it, it was left out. So in those in those initial moments, uh, the initial months of the pandemic, when when we, we really were like on a lockdown situation, and there was a lot of quiet in the, in the world, um, as sound artists, how you know, does that change or develop 
your practice was, were those um, just thinking about how you you approach finding sounds, thinking about the way objects make sounds in buildings and sites, were those moments of creativity? Because it seems like you have had all these wonderful events and you've been incredibly productive. Um, was that a moment of, of a lot of creative energy for the three of you? Well, that's, an, that's, that's a really interesting question from the standpoint of um, my own experience, which was, of course, being locked down and and uh, but also suddenly being aware of because of the sort of increase in quietude that occurred early on in the pandemic it was yep. there was uh, it, it just became evident that there was less traffic there was less air travel there was all of this stuff that somehow became the basis for um for me it was the response to that was to realize that I was hearing things in my backyard that I ordinarily wouldn't be able to hear because they'd be masked by the, the, the otherwise normal sounds of, of our uh, of urban reality. And I sort of used that to advantage and went out and recorded backyard using very sensitive microphones and realizing that um, so much was, the, the one day that was spectacular was uh, in Easter, Easter 2020, in my backyard, I went out and I started to record. I set up a number of different microphones. And not only was there, of course, less traffic and the sounds being masked, it was also because it was Easter morning, there was less activity and it was just extraordinary. It was like, wow, there's just sounds that are going on. And anyway, yeah, so it was the basis of a, of a He's recent- He's got a new, a new CD. Yeah, let's do a little uh, hype here for my- Yeah, he sent me on- um... <laughs> by mail look at this you can get your own <laughs> yes and of course nobody has a cd player anymore <laughs> like Wonderful. it's just a pretty object but so uh, so yeah so I, I think that's that's one of the things that became very clear and it's also become very clear that that we weren't it wasn't just humans that 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 this was an awareness that was occurring it was wildlife the changes and the and the, the uh, increase in, in uh, wildlife activity has been pretty, pretty extraordinary. Well, in, in Miami, the skies became clear, clearer, I saw. Uh, I spend a lot of time at home, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, if not to go to the store, which was the, the part of going out that became kind of, okay, so let's very, 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 be very careful early on, uh, you know, just going out, you know, taking a walk with the beach, there's nobody around. Uh, yeah, the sensation was that, hey, it was easier, easier to monitor, easier to, to understand uh, what, that's, what that's about. Wow. Yeah. Uh, your, your, your senses didn't have to work so hard. <laughs> we didn't go to the Everglades. Uh, I should have done that. But, <laughs> but then we uh, we went to the Deering State, which is rather close. <laughs> and you know, there we. I mean, I have to say that this residency, of course, I. I, I you know, of the three of us, I was the one that I think took advantage of it the most because I, I was the one that was more available. Uh, and, uh, but you know, the opportunity to make a, a relationship with the grounds and the architecture, uh, you know, when, when, when Rene and I were able to go and record together and this and that, I mean, really, you know, all of that, and then the relationship with the staff. I think that the during state, if I can, you know, say something, uh, it's been really fantastic in terms of, uh, you know, in in the way that it just offered this notion of a residency, 
right? For somebody like me and Renee and David as an artist, it's not necessarily, I don't see it as an opportunity to, to put something in my resume, but, but instead as an opportunity to deepen into a practice that's really uh, important. And I think that during state, uh, a, a, a situation such as that, that this is particularly important and exciting for some for artists like us. Uh, I was I was thinking about my favorite residencies, you know, in the last 10, 20 years. And one was Vizcaya, where I had I got to work with the with the organ. You know, it, it, it says Vizcaya Gardens and Museum, you know, or museum and gardens, but it isn't, you know, a museum like an art museum. It's a, it's a preservation space. Um, and uh, so, and, and I was the, the first artist in that program in 2006. So there was not really a history there yet of artist engagement. And I tend to gravitate to opportunities like that because um, uh, people are beginning to figure out what they want to do with this notion of a residency. But in your case, you, you've been doing residency for a long time. Another residency like this was the one at, Airy, at, at, the, at the Everglades, the one month. Uh, David came over and spent a week, uh, you know, and since then, you know, with Renee, with been going to the Everglades. He helped me establish a, a deeper and more interesting relationship with the Everglades. Made me, it made me feel like, uh, I mean, took away some of the um, uh, possible fears I may have had. Well, I may run into an alligator or whatever. Well, guess what? No, this is really not <laughs> really a, a concern. And, uh, you know, so we, we would go out at three o'clock in the morning and spend like most of the night. Or, uh, well, we'll go out earlier. Like six in the afternoon, but 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 go all the way. The mosquitoes to six are in the more morning. dangerous than the alligators, actually. That's that's right, exactly. <laughs> and we have lots of recordings uh, of the mosquitoes. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, kudos to the Deering State. I hope uh, you know this is the beginning of a of an ongoing relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. Having you. I mean, I mean, paranormal having it in the space is is something for someone like me that that's in those houses every day. Really, um, it's altered the experience of being in the space for me, who knows it very well. It's a whole new. Um, it's like a whole new site. Spending time there, coming in at different moments in the composition, um, and then seeing our audiences respond to it has been really, really great. And that's why for historic house museums, like for us in Vizcaya, bringing in contemporary artists really gives mm -hmm. us a new level of narrative and context to mm -hmm. our stories. Um, wonderful. So it's wonderful. Uh, the show is up through June 13th. So for anyone who's in Miami, please feel free to come. Um, it is something you should experience for yourself. And uh, are there any sound picnics coming up that you want to share? Yeah, in two days we have a, a, a picnic called Summer. And that is uh, a, our last picnic in, in Miami Beach at the Collins Park. It's uh, Thursday, May 20th at 6 p.m. And then the, the next one would hopefully will be at the Deering State in July, July 24th. Is um, is World Listening Day, so we're being invited to to make a proposal for that, and you know, sound picnic. So we will do a long, maybe a long one this this time um, on the Saturday, the twenty fourth, and then our our next event will be in September, uh, September sixteenth. Uh, hopefully. Uh, well, what it's going to be is going to be the world premiere of a piece called Sound Paintings, which is derived from the original piece by David Dunn. It's a combination of 120 channels of sound and a film um, that's 
being created specifically for the Constellation Sound System at Soundscape Park. So it's going to be accessible for free and huge. You know, this we, we've done this once and in 2015, and we had such a great time working with the sound system. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. So, and that hopefully will be one of the, uh, I mean, the opening event of the Subtropics Festival, the 25th edition of the Subtropics Festival, uh, which is uh, organized by the Subtropics Organization, uh, which I run, and, and that's, that's our history in the next few months. <laughs> Any individual projects? We always include this time to, to plug anything, anything you want to share? Uh, frozen music. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking, of, no, no, I've been thinking about a lot of stuff, uh, but these are big, really big projects. Who knows whenever those things uh, will have a, a time. Right now, you know, the pandemic for me opened the door to engage in projects that I had no intention in getting involved with because of the extent of the idea. So the fact is that I had all that time and I didn't really finish. So <laughs> I'm still working on that. Well, I want to thank the three of you so much for your time, for, for the space and joining us tonight, and also for creating this wonderful piece that, again, is on view at the Deering Estate every day, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, Monday through Sunday, um, in the Richmond Cottage. Good. And we, um, yeah, we will also be doing another, for those of you that weren't able to join us on our super full moon performance, we will be inviting Frozen Music back for another sound picnic this summer. Excellent. So thank you very much. Thank you, three of you, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Us. We enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs>